All right. Um, Everyone, uh, welcome tonight to Art Center Sarasota. Thanks for coming um, to be a part of our Artist Talk series. So um, for the past couple of years now, every exhibition cycle, we try to bring in the artists for an artist talk. It's a really wonderful opportunity to be able to kind of, as I say, like get inside the head of an artist, which we don't always have the opportunity to do during an opening. Um, I want to say thanks to Christina and to Cassie who work really tirelessly for our exhibitions department putting this together. There's a lot of orchestration um, behind not only mounting an exhibition, but then the coordination of bringing an artist here to talk um, about their work. Um, so tonight we're very fortunate to have exhibiting artist Tom Casimir um, in conversation with our exhibitions. Uh, director Christina Burrell. So um, thank you for coming in tonight. And thank everybody here for uh, coming to listen to the talk. Um, Tom's work has been featured here at the Art Center um, in several of our juried shows, which some of you may have seen. It's, uh, his work is very iconic, so it's hard to miss it in our juried shows. And that's now led to a solo show, which is something that I think we're really proud of here at the Art Center is um, seeing artists um, not only in our jury shows, but being able to see them have a solo show where they get to mount a body of work, um, which gives a lot more context to their practice. Um, so I'm thrilled to introduce Tom tonight. His sculptures are a visual exploration of the many shapes and forms inspired by machinery, diagrams, blueprints, and schematics, interrogating the relationship between mechanical forms and human systems, resulting in a visual language encompassing the interconnectedness of man, machine, and nature. Wood is what becomes the canvas for Tom's sculptures. The organic forms of it are shaped into systematic pieces and parts that come together as one structure. The work looks, in my opinion, futuristic, robotic, and synchronized and yet it speaks to traces of our industrial past all at the same time, transcending temporal boundaries. Entitled Gestalt, Tom's body of work speaks to this theory that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and what makes up the entirety cannot be fully understood by analyzing individual components in isolation, a thought that comes into play when we think about the human body itself. Gestalt, a pattern, a system, a configuration. It's something that our language has yet to have a word for. Tom's show invites us to appreciate the beauty and complexity that emerges from his seamless integration of mechanical organic elements, offering a unique perspective on the relationship between machine and human. So tonight, please join me in welcoming exhibiting artist Tom Kasner. I'll be yeah. Thank you, Kinsey, for that wonderful introduction. And Tom, thank you so much for coming. Your work Pleasure. is just yes. a delightful show. Um, so I want to thank all of you as well for coming. I thought we might start our conversation with your journey in the art world. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about how you found art to be your calling and your career in illustration? Yeah, it's been a long, long road. Um, I grew up in a household where um, 1950s, 1960s, my dad built the house I grew up in. Um, he could repair the cars that we had. He worked for the Ford Motor Company. Uh, my mom did, you know, was a, a housewife raising three boys. I'm the youngest of three. And in that household, um, it wasn't really, I mean, the first time I really remember art in the house was um, when I, my folks came home from a department store with department store something, you know, a, a, a painting that had texture and was raising off the surface. And I knew nothing about it, but it filled the space on the wall in my house. Um, those kind of memories are, you know, abound, but 
as a child, I was occasionally shuffled off across the street to Mrs. Newman's house when my mom mm -hmm. had to go um, away for the day to, I think at that time it was because my dad was in, in the hospital and my mom would go away for parts of the day to go visit him. And so I'd go over to Mrs. Newman's house and we'd sit and we'd draw. And she had orange crush and donuts. And um, those, you know, that's an early memory of sitting down and drawing. As a kid, I had a lazy eye. Um, my dad built me a balance board and the different things to kind of strengthen the eye. But another exercise was looking into this machine and having to draw with both hands on whatever it was I saw through the, the projection on the, on the, through the eyepieces. And so it was kind of this coordinated thing. And it just kind of, in its own way, besides the stuff you do in school, you know, um, it kind of introduced me to drawing. It wasn't really until my older brother, who went off to the University of Minnesota to study architecture, he had to take some drawing classes, he had to take some painting classes. And he started to bring his projects home. And I basically idolized him anyway. Um, if he did that, I was going to do that. He played guitar. I played guitar. He played trumpet. I played trumpet. The um, thing is, I kept with the trumpet and the guitar, and he went off and became an architect and, and did all that. Um, and the other brother was brilliant with numbers. He's an actuary um, until he retired. So, and then here's little Tommy Kasmer, who um, I'm not a very good student, and I, and I wasn't a very good student. Um, with math and science, but I enjoyed the art side of things. I enjoyed music. And that just always seemed to be my temperament. That seemed to be the direction that I, I tended to gravitate toward anyway. So um, those kinds of, you know, just growing up experiences kind of planted the seed, but I never really thought about art as, as anything. In kindergarten, they ask you the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And um, the only memory I really have of my answer is that I like to take things and collect them and put them in a box <laughs> and arrange them. You know? And okay, now here it is 50 years later, that's exactly what I'm still doing. Um, but it's been an interesting road to kind of um, get from you know, that to, to what I'm doing now. Um, so, uh, as you know, we talk all the time. so it's. She has to kind of say, okay, now <laughs> get back on track. Where were we? So you actually had quite a career as an illustrator. After, well, I was fortunate. Both my brothers got scholarships to go to college. I didn't want to go to college. At that point, I was a musician. I was playing clubs. I was living the life. I, I was very happy. Um, but they said, no, 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 you're going to go. I said, no, man. yes, you um, so I was able to go to a small liberal arts college in St. Paul, Minnesota, on Hamlin University, and I started off as an English major. I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I liked to read. I did some writing, so okay, that's an English major. And then um, I wandered around campus and found the art department, and I never left. I, I switched my major and was taking painting classes, drawing classes, the usual classes that you would take at a liberal arts college. Then I did major in fine art painting and drawing with a minor in English. Um, so I graduated college with you know that degree and went right back to playing music. And then, I, but then on the side I was painting. And then um, I got married and I thought, well, I'm a responsible individual. Am I going to continue to play clubs and paint on the side, or do I do something else? Um, but I wanted it to be dealing with art. So I went back to school because I'd already done the four years of liberal arts degree. I didn't, I went back to a small college called what is at the time the School of Associated Arts, also in St. Paul. And um, I was able to double major in illustration and graphic design. Didn't have to worry about all the other courses because I'd already done that at my other college. And so in two years, I had an intense focus. Had I been smarter, I think I probably could have done graduate school. You know, I said, oh, those two years could have been better spent but those two years that I spent at that college really kind of helped formulate um, a different part of my um, interest. And that was where I was really starting to draw and illustrate and design. And, um, you know, as you start to study those things, I'm guessing there isn't a person in the room that hasn't at one point, um, you know, talked about the elements and 
principles of design where you, you know, you're thinking about line and shape and color and texture and value and all these different things that you utilize to create what a painting, a drawing, a sculpture. Um, and learning about all of those there, more so than I did when I was in college, because that was the late 60s and early 70s, and my mind was elsewhere. Um, <laughs> but when I really started to focus on you know, what I wanted to do, I've been thinking, um, this is what I'm going to be doing for a career, um, studying illustration, graphic design. I did that, and I was fortunate. I, I got a job right out of school, and I went into a small design firm, um, where at the time we were doing um, illustration and prop building for um, the city for computers. So they were doing, those of you may remember, what they used to have the stacks of the slide projectors, multi-projector you know, shows, and uh, I did a lot of art for those. Um, so I was doing a little, little bit of building, of props, and mostly drawing, painting, designing. And I uh, went from there to um, another small design group. Then I got a job in a corporate art department for what is now Wells Fargo that was in Minneapolis and did a lot of work there. Um, and they kept wanting me to go into management and I kept wanting to stay at the drawing board. <laughs> and so I left there and went freelance. And remember, this is me trying to be responsible and I am married. I'm, I have a son at that point and two more to follow. And um, at that point I decided I'm going to go freelance um, and leave the, the job, you know, the security of that full-time job and go freelance. Um, which afforded me the opportunity to learn about a lot about business, to learn a lot about um, how to manage that and still try and you know, do my art and to raise a family and to do all these things. Um, so that kind of led me to have the opportunity to do some teaching. And uh, at the school I graduated from, one of my instructors had to leave to get some surgery. He asked me to cover his classes for him. Keep in mind, I was probably 27 to 29 when I went back to school. And um, so I was able to um, take over his classes and I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed teaching, I enjoyed working with the students. And um, that was probably 1981. And I just retired now from Ringling in 2021. So um, teaching kind of became my, the backbone of, of what I was doing. I had that, and that also did a wonderful thing, which freed me up to be a little bit more selective about what I chose to do as an illustrator. And um, and then at a certain point, in more recent years, it kind of freed me up more to do what I'm, I'm doing now. Um, so, does that answer that question? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> more than you wanted to know. So what Tom didn't allude to was that he was an illustrator instructor at Ringling. I was, yep. And so I don't think most of you could even imagine that um, wood, as your primary medium, you only started working in four years ago. Yeah. So can you just tell us, like, what was that aha moment when you were like, that's the one? Oh. Um. About four years ago, um, there's a little gallery over on Central Avenue called Gaze Modern in the Argos Building. And there is a, a show being coordinated called Shop Liftable. And the whole idea was that everything in the show had to be quite small so you could tuck it in your coat and walk out the door. Um, and I, at the time, I had been doing similar subject matter, but um, I, would, I would take my drawings and I would scan them and I would do prints of my drawings. Um, you know, this one here, this is the drawing for, it's messy, it's bad, but this is a drawing for a piece that's up there around the corner called Solstice, um, you know, working to that size, and just on a piece of Bristol paper, so, you know, taking that kind of drawing and then scanning it and going into Photoshop and starting to paint them there. Um, previously, I would have canvas and I would, similar subject matter, but I'd be doing the drawing on the canvas, then I would paint. Um, and, and that was sort of fulfilling. Um, but then the shop liftable thing came up and I thought, okay, I'm gonna do something. I want to have something so you can physically pick it up. And I thought, maybe I'll do a cute little easel and I'll do a bunch of little prints of my things and put them on the easel. And, and then I thought, well, maybe I'll make like a, a, a totem of some sort, some sort of a, a billboard almost. And so I created a little four by maybe 10 inch 
totem column, and um, I was going to take some of my prints and just kind of glue them on the side, yeah. and um, which is basically what I've been doing. I was making prints up in, based on the drawing and then scanning and painting, and then there was kind of this moment where I wanted to make it somehow more dimensional. And my wife was painting on cradle panels, you know, um, plywood or, or birch panels on a little bit of a wooden frame, like one by two. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll build some of those and I'll take my prints and I'll put it on that. And that will maybe give it a little bit of a different kind of thing rather than just a digital print in a frame. Um, and they're horrible to try and glue anything down on wood. I mean, to take a print and get it down, you know, I didn't have a dry mount machine. I was using whatever I could to get the bubbles out. And it was not fun. It was nerve wracking, it was horrible. And so I had this opportunity, but that's what I was gonna do. And then I decided, well, you know, I've got kind of this idea. What if I just, instead of doing the print, just start to create some of the shapes and put them on there. I didn't have a drawing for that. I just started kind of going free form. Um, the piece is owned by the Ringling College now, but I know there are possible sticks. <laughs> I know, I know there are like little car wheels, you know, so some of it was found, yeah, kind of object, kind of thing, assembled, but then I was cutting and gluing and making my own shapes. Um, and once I started doing that, that's the aha moment, that's just something happened about that. Uh, with, with those materials, um, wood was something that I was familiar with in the sense that I'd done a little bit of um, cabinet making at home, um, bookcases and, and things like that. So I had a few tools and I was able to quickly just kind of put something together. And then I, I had like, I don't know, a few days to kind of get all the materials onto it and it was done. And it, I just kind of stood back and recognized that there was something very different about that process for me that is much more satisfying than anything I had done the previous 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, you know, it was just a realization. It wasn't that I was unhappy doing what I was doing. It was just, what have you been all my life? You know, one of those kinds of moments. And um, from that point on, I kind of put the digital print stuff down and just started developing the, the sculpts. And um, I think because I had so much fun with that first little one, which was tiny, in the exhibit, in the corner, there's a corner piece. Um, called corner construction. And I believe that was about the second piece that I had done. So, and that one, again, I had the drawing figured out. Um, and I wasn't sure at the point, I had the drawing and I actually did the digital print and I mounted it on the cradle panels and did all that. So I had this clunky box with the kind of bumped up to each other and I thought, oh, that's kind of cool, but I'm gonna go back to that totem thing. And I built that one and um, I don't think I've done a digital print really since then. I've just been sculpting and sculpting and sculpting. So um, everything that's in the show and the other pieces that aren't in the show, I think, yeah, they're all within the last four years. And it just kind of keeps going and going and going. And going. Yeah. Well, I think it's uh, it's great because the, the title of your show, The Salt, yeah. um, literally means um, an organized whole that is perceived as more than the sum of its parts. And you could see that in your early drawings and prints. Um, but I'm curious, you know, this idea is so valuable in interpreting and viewing abstraction. So, you know, can you explain maybe some of the different and specific pairings that you do with line and shape um, that may affect your overall composition and the, the feelings of these works? Um. Well, like Christina's saying, line and shape, I mean, everything, it looks planned, it is planned, um, yet the planning process is, is really organic. Everything that I start with is basically line and shape. Um, it's just kind of what I've been, as an illustrator, I'm just having to do thumbnails, I had to do comps, I had to do finished art, and all of that. Um, so I got used to um, drawing, and there's a, a line, I'm going to call it a line quality because I spend time doing it, um, but I might draw everything quickly with a sharpie, and you know, straight edges and circle templates and so on, but it's very organic. I may have a, a, an idea of, I want to do something vertical, um, but I'll start on a piece of paper and 
maybe start in a corner and it's a very organic kind of process. It just sort of presents itself to me as I'm going. It's a constant reaction. I start with the shape and then that informs what I might do in the next shape. And I'd maybe start with some of the larger shapes and then kind of work to the interior of things. But again, it's always about the, the line and shape. Um, some of the, you know, the, the artists that I, I look to that have been really influential in, in my mind's eye as far as um, what I'm doing now, German expressionists, people like um, Paul Klee and Kandinsky and um, some other people, Louise Nevelson's name keeps coming up because of the wood and, and the blackness of, of some of the work. But um, the thing about Clay and Kandinsky was always, I found their pieces that had line and their line and shape intrigued me. And it was also that the aspect of, um, I mean, I, I'm looking around this show and I, I'm, I'm impressed with anybody that can you know, paint beautifully. Um, and, and do a still life and really control paint. I'm married to a painter who's a very good painter. And I, I respect you know, all of those things about it. And even though I have a career as an illustrator, I'm not that great a painter. I can illustrate. I'm, I, was, I think what I would call it like a working man's illustrator. If you, you know, somebody came to me and said, I need something kind of like this, can you do it? Yeah, I can do it. Um, and so I have that, uh, that ability, but um, the thing about Clay and Kandinsky was I gravitated towards the pieces that really got, you know, the kind of the shape in space and I could really understand. Here's, they created this two-dimensional plane, this, whether it was a canvas or whatever, and within that plane they had these shapes. And the way my mind works, I guess, that's really what I gravitated toward. I mean, I can go and look at a beautiful still life and appreciate the arrangement of, arrangement of those shapes on that two-dimensional plane. Um, but it doesn't strike me necessarily the same way. It's just a different part of my brain, I think, that appreciates the abstraction and the na you know that nature of some of the things that I'm looking at. So you know those kinds of influences, um, you know, kind of stick with me. I I knew that we were going to talk about some of this stuff, so I was just kind of going back, looking at some Clay and Kandinsky the other day, and um, it was like coming home. It was pretty pretty fun. Yeah, I mean, I think if anyone takes half a second to look it up, you can clearly see the um, influence there. Yeah. And with Nevelson, I mean, sure, you're both using wood, you're both using monotone colors, yeah. but there's a lot that's different in your concepts and in your process. Um, what do you think are those the greatest differences there? Well, she, uh, quick story, when I was in college, Little, little Hamlin University in St. Paul, Minnesota, the head of our department, Paul Smith, took a bunch of us to New York for a couple of weeks in the wintertime, probably 1972, I'm guessing. I graduated in 73. So um, we went to New York and you know, we had a hotel right off of Times Square, which in the 70s, Times Square was not very nice. So my mom went, wow, <laughs> this is New York. Yeah. Um, so we had a chance to be there and experience that. And here's a kid from Minnesota in New York for the first time, and it was, you know, <laughs> help, help. And he knew people. Um, the, the sculptor, Dwayne Hansen, uh, we have in town here, Dowd? Jack Dowd. Jack Dowd, who does, you know, the realistic figurative mm -hmm. things. Um, Dwayne Hansen did the museum guard kind of thing where very realistic and fully dressed characters that he would create in place in, in different settings. Um, got to meet him, got to go to his studio. Paul Smith, for whatever reason, however, knew Louise Nelson, and we got to go to her studio in New York and kind of walk around and, and just see the bins and the stacks of all the discarded lumber and, and furniture and things that she would have to use in her work. Her work is finding, you know, is found object, is finding scraps of, of wood and you know, here's a headboard for the bed that has some interesting scrolling and some different shapes that um, she would use. And so it was kind of found and assembled in these kind of boxes and then those boxes might be a huge wall installation or it might be, you know, pieces similar to mine. She does have wall-related pieces and so on. Um, 
she found her, her pieces and with her mind she her whole idea was to take those pieces and arrange them and, and to put them together in that way. Um, and as, as Kenzie read kind of in a much better artist statement than I think I've read, um, she kind of described the difference uh, nicely. It, it's you know, each piece within any of my sculpts is handmade. Um, whether it's taking a dowel and cutting it or um, it's taking a piece of wood and creating a basic shape and then kind of building up on it and so on. Um, mostly because my influences are, as she described, schematics and blueprints and machines and engines and, and things like that. And you know, those are the things that are of interest to me. You know, I don't understand them necessarily how they work, but the shapes have always intrigued me and the, the way that they're assembled and connected and all of that um, has always been of interest. And, as it comes out in the work now, I think that's kind of evident. Um, those are the shapes that I enjoy. I also like to go to a figure drawing session and just draw the figure. But when it comes back, time to go to the studio, I'm, you know, I keep gravitating back to this. So what is your overall process in creating the sculpts, as you sculpts. like to call them? I love yeah. that. Um, I know it's very, you know, intense. Well, it, you know, it's the process. and. I, I do start with the drawing, and at a certain point, you know, this is the drawing for the piece around the corner that's called um, Solstice. Can I set this down on screen? But then I make a blueprint. I send off to Staples. <coughs> they, they will um, make blueprints for me and to size. So. Yeah, and this one's all fit together. It had to go into two parts, and so. Okay, can you hold that up for a second so I can take a picture? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sorry, guys. I'm yeah. like almost ignoring you. Yeah, got it. Got it. So this goes up in the garage, which is my place where I construct the studio. Um, I have a lovely room to sit and draw in, and then I go out in the garage and I, I, I make messes. Um, <laughs> but, so that goes up on the wall, in a case like this, the wall is too short because I've got a workbench in front of it, so I just put it up on the door, and I'm, I'm able to use it for a lot of different reasons. I can go to it and I can take a measurement off it and bring that measurement back to what I'm working on. But it brings it, you know, takes this drawing, puts it to scale, and then I can utilize that in a lot of different ways. And, you know, this feels very tight and organized, but, you know, from that point to that point to the point where you start to build, um, there's this moment of, you know, it's like jazz, you know, you're jamming for a while. Yes, you're, you're kind of putting the pieces that you designed together, but you're also in the process of taking it from a two-dimensional form to a three-dimensional form. And all of a sudden, you've really got to start to play with height and dimension and depth and thinking in that third dimension. And when you look at the drawing, things can be interpreted in a lot of different ways as far as is this place, is this piece elevated, is this piece receding? I mean, my whole process is additive. There's nothing really subtractive about it. I'm cutting pieces, I'm always adding and adding and adding. Um, so, you know, that part of the process, it's helpful for me to have the blueprint. It gives me the basis of what I want to do. And if you look at the, the drawing, you look at the sculpt, to say, well, yeah, that's the same, that's the same. And then you'll find a little area where I you know, kind of very, you know, went off on a tangent from what I was doing originally. And it, because at that point, you're, you're, you're no longer really in conversation with this as you are in conversation with what's in front of you, the piece that you're building. And um, I mean, literally, I, I do have conversations with the piece. I apologize <laughs> to a piece of wood if I go, I can't use you right now. Don't put you in this box. Maybe, you know, I do. I'm, it, it's kind of, but that's, that's nothing more than a person alone in a room with wood, I guess. <laughs> but, um, it's, it is, <laughs> it, 
Um, it is. I mean, it is that conversation I think any of us that are making art we have with whatever it is we're doing. Um, maybe mine becomes a little bit more literal, but I bet you everybody talks to what it is they're working on. <laughs> but I mean, that's kind of the process. Um, I build the cradle panel just like um, a painter might work on, and then I kind of I heavy up the surface of it to maybe a half inch piece of plywood, so I have a basis to work on for the wall railings, and then I kind of build up from there, and I can add ex you know, additional pieces and build up on those surfaces. So again, that translation from two to three D is is really where it, it starts to be fun, and you, you don't know exactly where it's going to go. Um, I, I don't think I've created anything as a wall relief that has much more than maybe seven and a half inches of depth from the highest point to the wall. Um, you know, so somewhere between five and maybe seven and a half inches or something like that. Um, which is kind of a, a workable limitation that, you know, I think in, when I say limitation, I think it's also the thing that gives me the freedom to explore those surfaces maybe in a little bit different way than um, I would if I was um, working totally in the round like I have on a couple of pieces. And I think, you know, that sort of seven inches is also safe for us, right, in the gallery. Right. <laughs> um, you want to put your eye out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I think no one would doubt your attention to detail and your attention to craftsmanship. Um, sometimes, though, you are allowing the mark of the maker to be left behind on the work. So I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about where you see those lines being drawn between craft and art, and maybe where they're blurring in your work as well. Yeah. Um, I taught you know, illustration, figure drawing um, for a long time. And so student, art students don't want to go to art school and hear the word craft because then they think they're going to a craft school or they're doing something other than being an artist. Um, but I make them listen to me say the word and I, I show them what I'm talking about. And in my mind, the whole sense of craft is, I think, the effort and the attention you give. I think that's really what craft is. I mean, you can apply it to anything. My dad was a millwright and a mechanic and you know, he could do all these things. He, he developed skills, he developed you know, craft, he, it mattered to him, and, and to, in my mind, that's what craft is. You know, it's that part of your process that allows you to um, take it to, to the next level of not only accomplishment, you know, you're going to complete the piece, you're going to finish the piece, but you're going to bring it a certain, I think, standard, a certain quality um, uh, to the work. And, and I think a mechanic can be a craftsman. I think a doctor you know, can exhibit their craft. Any profession has their craft to it. Um, so it's, it's not a dirty word. It's just uh, something that goes hand in hand with being an artist, I think, if you, when you're paying attention to what it is you're doing. And yeah, I mean, I'm crafting, if you will, each individual piece. And that's why I went with the whole idea of gestalt, the whole idea of these hundreds and hundreds of tiny little pieces that I will craft and make. And then they become part of the, you know, the whole, the, the assembled thing. And um, we were talking about Wabi Sabi the other day. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of imperfections in, in the work out there. And I won't say they're intentional, but they're human. Uh, you know, you look at some of the pieces that aren't painted and you can maybe see, you can see the word filler. You can see that pencil line I forgot to erase before I put a finish on it. Um, you know, those, and some of the painted ones. Um, my painting process isn't perfect, and sometimes the paint gets a little bit too thick, and it kind of does a thing on the surface. Um, do I take another day and a half and sand that all down and bring it back and try and refine it, or do I leave it and say that part's okay because it's part of this whole? And um, I tend to leave those things. I don't mind that. That's kind of um, a fun thing that starts up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so for me, one of the really magical moments in your show is this versatility in your work and how we can view it ourselves. So for instance, 
when you're approaching the show, the body of work has a really commanding, bold, intense presence. But at the same time, you can go up to each piece and have this really intense, like, intimate moment with all the little pieces in the close-up. So what is your goal for us as viewers in that dichotomy in the work and the space itself? Just what you just said. Um, <laughs> I was talking to Phil yesterday, and he said something to me that really hit home. Um, he'd come in to see the show and um, approach the little red guy, the artifact piece. And you know, it, it has figurative quality to it. Um, and in looking at that, he said that, you can probably say this better than I do, but there's just this um, story, this narrative that he had a sense of with that figure, um, recognized, okay, this is a figure, I can relate to that on a certain level, and uh, you know, what's the story with this one? And then the realization that if he could have that kind of reaction to that piece, that had some things that may be more recognizable to us all, you know, the, the figurative side of things, then maybe that's possible with each and every other piece. You know, is there that, how would, do you remember what you said yesterday, Phil? <laughs> I don't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, <laughs> you say, hey, it, it plants that seed and kind of pieces the brain to think that there's something that's in all of them that's going to be recognized. Okay. Look at that. <laughs> and, I think that's part of you know what I would hope people can do. It you know maybe it's experience. I mean, it's named Gestalt for for a reason. We were talking earlier. You know, when we go outside and we look at a tree, we see the tree, and then all of a sudden we kind of look at the branches. We look at the way it kind of grows. There's a bird's nest. There's a squirrel. You know, all these different things. So you you know here's the the whole thing, and here's the parts that kind of go together together to kind of make that shape. Um, I think that's that's the joy of what I get when I sculpt these things. I, I would hope that you know anybody viewing them can kind of have a sense of that too. Adult, adult Legos. Say what? Adult Legos. Let me say this. I'm deaf, so I'm sorry. Mary, what did she say? They, they remind me of adult Legos. Like, oh, okay. I put those on my wall. They're like for adults, but they give you the joy, the passion. Yeah. Like that fierceness that you have when you're like building a Lego set when you're three years old, five years old, ten years old. Yeah. How like many years old? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Eight, yeah. 800. Which is. You're 800. Good. Yes. You don't look it. So, I mean, I think one of the elements that really makes the work bold is the monotone color. And I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about how you choose your colors and sort of what significance they bring to each work. I, you know, as, as you're working on a piece, they start to present their personalities. And I can look at the shape as a whole, and if it feels playful um, to me, I, I may not necessarily want it to go to black. I like the black ones. Um, because they, it, it just kind of unifies the whole thing. Any, they're all very monochromatic for that reason. It kind of takes away the construction and, and the, the detail, and it just does a nice job of unifying the entire shape. And that's the intent. Um, black does it a certain way, the white does it a certain way, the yellow, the red, and the gray, a certain way. They all have different things, but they also all catch the light in a little bit of a different way. Um, and, you know, Every time I've seen my work hung in a gallery, um, the lighting may vary just a little bit, and the shadows are different each time. Uh, and I, I enjoy that part of it. Um, so, you know, that in itself, I think, um, helps to define some things. The figurative piece, the little artifact, um, red piece, it was figurative, and what I just wanted something to kind of show the richness of that. I wanted it to have that warmth. Um, the, there's one called Automaton. Um, remember the movie Big? He goes with the, the fortune telling machine kind of thing. Um, that's kind of what an automaton is. And um, that part, that piece just had some of that aspect to it. And it seemed to be a little bit more whimsical and playful. Um, the one called Flugel, 
I looked up the word flugo. There's flugo horn, but there's no word as flugo until I did that piece. So now the word flugo exists, um, I guess, and the piece exists. Uh, so there you go. Um, and again, it's a very playful piece. Some, you know, the, the, the middle gray that I use, I think, is you know, more of a machine kind of color that uh, I use it on a piece called Transmission. It's on another piece over here called <coughs> Venerable One. Um, and again, it's kind of a, just a little bit of a, a mid-tone that, again, kind of takes away the whole sense of maybe the construction of things and just kind of unifies the, the whole body and the shape of everything. Well, Flugel is definitely one of my favorites. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I would love to know what was the biggest thing that you learned in creating this show and what will you take forward with that knowledge? That's a tough one. Um, you learn from each piece. Um, MOFO, <laughs> which really stands for <laughs> Mechanism of Feasible Engines, <laughs> and it's a big MOFO. Um, <laughs> we know it's the engine. <laughs> um, that was a challenge in that I set that one for myself because there's a certain scale of a couple of pieces are quite large, you know, five feet this way and so on. But um, I, I wanted to do something that had a different kind of um, presence and I wanted it to have kind of that interconnectivity of, you know, beyond like triptych or diptych or quadriptych or anything would be. There's a word for a six piece tick. Hexaptic? No. Was that Didn't it? Didn't yes. we figure it yeah, out? I think yeah, we did. We had a very complicated name. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Hexaptic? Yeah. So it, it's six individual elements. They only go together one way and you couldn't rearrange them in multiple different ways. Maybe I'll do that sometime, but that wasn't my intent. Um, I wanted to experiment with something like that. Um, and could it have been done as a singular piece? Yes. Do I want to move that singular piece? <laughs> no. Um, so I, I can kind of construct it that way. And But that modular aspect of it was of interest to me. Because I've done triptychs and I've done diptychs. I just wanted to kind of explore that. What happens to the negative space between them? It was designed to have about a half inch, maybe three quarter inch float each individual thing, which allowed you know, the negative space to kind of come forward, and also an opportunity for some different arrangement of shadows and things. Um, what I took away from that is I'm going to do smaller pieces now. I would like to do you know, a series of very small. I saw an image from a, a show somewhere, and it was like a linear a wall of just you know, smaller pieces like maybe eight by eight, vertical, just all the way around. Maybe they're all in boxes. Maybe they're all, they all have different irregular kind of edges. I don't know. Um, and I, I brought out two of the freestanding sculpts um, for this show as well. And I haven't done a lot of those um, since. And I've got an idea for one that's kind of on the drawing table. Um, a piece that I want to do again, a kind of a totem type thing, only again in the round. So that. Honestly, this still feels new to me. I mean, I've only been doing this for the sculpting side of things for a few years, and um, I feel like I'm just kind of scratching the surface. So I could see just kind of continuing to do what I'm doing um, for quite a while. Um, by the same token, as I look at, you know, where I get inspiration from, there's a piece. Um, Oh, uh, Condor. Condor. A gray piece, kind of a horizontal piece. You know, the inspiration for that was taking my dogs for a walk, and there was a piece of bark on the ground that had some moss on one end, and, you know, a stick or something on it, but it's kind of stuck with it, and it's just kind of this horizontal composition that stuck with me. I went home and did a quick little, I mean, scribble, not, not a, a drawing. Um, nothing like that, although I do have a drawing for it that is like that now. Um, so, you know, talking about different materials, maybe I should do something where I'm, you know, I'm not refining each individual piece of wood and 
work with me and um, finding different pieces and refining them in a different way. Maybe I evolved to using falling object and to kind of go full circle and um, when I die, I go to heaven, Louise and I can have a chance. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I mean, that was optimistic, going to heaven. And, you, know, <laughs> you never know. I think above all else, um, this show is just so wonderful in that you are putting yourself completely out there and your inspiration is so clear. Um, as someone that has transferred their main medium from drawing to sculpting, what would you, you know, advise other artists that are struggling to find their voice, okay. their aesthetic? Um, you're an inspiration. Okay, well, here, yeah, wait. <laughs> Again, I, I taught illustration you know, for, for a very long time, and students are you know, just so hungry to, I gotta find a style, I gotta find a style. And you know, what they end up doing is seeing their favorite artists, and I only know this because I was a student myself, and I, I did it as an illustrator. You find that artist whose work you really admire, and maybe you develop your own work that looks a little bit too much like their work. Uh, overly influenced where you really, you know, we steal from everywhere. We do as artists. I mean, we steal ideas, we steal thoughts, we steal palettes, we steal everything. Um, and, and so their work is looking good, but it's looking a lot like you know, this person over here. And the advice that I, I gave them is, number one, don't be in such a hurry. It doesn't happen in the four years that you're here at school. You know, this is just boot camp. This is just your training ground. You're going to go out and you're going to continue and you're going to experience things and you're going to develop your own sense of self and your own sense of style in the work that you're doing. Um, so subject-wise, for me, I've been working with similar shapes and forms since the 70s. Um, they took the form of painting, they took the form of drawing, we kind of evolved into just enough you know, information about Photoshop. I started scanning my prints and printing them digitally and you know, all things like that. But, um, <clears throat> so it's been kind of back to the bubbling and it was back to that aha moment, you know, kind of coming full circle with that conversation. There's just that moment where I did that first sculpt and it was like, okay, this, this warrants more, you know, some more um, exploration. That's what this show is, is kind of the, the exploration of, of that aha moment. Well, I know we all can't wait to see the next show, um, but I think our audience probably has a bunch of questions for you. If okay. um, Cassie's going to hand around the microphone. You guys, just so you know, my She's wife certainly understands. Well, go ahead, because my hearing is horrible. <laughs> so, you know, be patient with me and use the microphone. Thank you, Tom. That was awesome. Um, I love hearing about process from any artist. I love going through their thinking and process with them. Yeah. You took us there. And, so, and I'm visualizing it because I'm a visual artist. Yeah. Are you looking flat? And at what point do you look at your work? Yeah. Um, yeah, everything like we were talking about starts on that box, that cradle panel. And I've, I've got a lovely, um, workbench on the garage that you can adjust the height on. And everything, every piece of the show is built on that table, which is that wide by, what is it, six feet, something like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, yes, I mean, I've got the, the cradle panel there that I'm working on, and I'm starting to build up on the surface. But during that time, there's always that, you know, kind of lifting it up, kind of seeing, you know, is it going the right way? There's moments where I'll, I'll pop up the, a stick behind it so I can kind of stand back and observe. But all the construction really happens when it's kind of, it's like on an operating table or something, you know, it's just kind of like that. Um, instead of taking away, I'm trying to, you know, build it up. But yeah. And I'm sure we get surprises once you see it up again and then, oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, That's too heavy over there. That's... Yeah, there's that, you know, that sense of crap. <laughs> you know, it's off. You know, you're seeing it this way and you think you've got everything. And some are intentionally very symmetrical and 
so you want that symmetry to um, be symmetrical. Um, and sometimes it's not quite, and you know, it's, it's close, and to, you know, then you get it up on the wall and you kind of go, mm -hmm. um, but that's where wabi-sabi comes in. You know, you just kind of enjoy the imperfections and say, okay, let's move on. And uh, the work implies precision. We all drive cars, we all have toasters, they all break down, you know, at a certain point. Um, you know, I think we allow for the imperfection in, in the work that we do as artists. Thank you. Yeah. And I noticed that you repeat the shapes in your drawings and in your three dimensions. Yeah. Do the, sh do the particular shapes you're using have any special meaning for you? Do they remind you of what I'm yeah. Um, well, I mean, sometimes they play, sometimes they're, they're intensive, they could be um, a key back, they could, I mean, they could be representative of a, a, a mechanical form. Um, you know, a button on a machine that you push to start it, um, any number of things. They also allow for some of the repetition to happen in a piece. Um, the, the, the shapes themselves, Kind of in, in my mind's eye, I think that the conversation that I'm having with pieces about you know, what is the intent of this piece, what should this piece be you know, in my mind's eye to be represented. Um, they, by varying the, you know, again back to elements and principles of design, I'll vary the scale. I mean, sometimes they're very, just talking about the wooden dolls for, for a minute. They come in a variety of different lengths and, and in dimensions, a quarter inch, half an inch, three eighths, up to handrail type type things. Um, I use them uh, sometimes to define proportion I, within a piece. I use them um, because they're uh, a shape. I think that's kind of a universal shape that I think um, we all. They, they appear in so many different aspects of what's going on. When you look at the uh, the, uh, the pad, the uh, take apart a, a, a computer and you know, start to look at the individual components, um, the repetition of some of our shapes um, are, are just part of its inherent nature. And I think I'm just trying to bring that inherent nature to what it is I'm doing. Um, I tend to use the kind of the gear shape. I might create a, a circular, semi-circular shape and then attach little square dolls around the edge of it to kind of um, get the thought of you know, that gear. But it also translates into different things on the figure piece. It's no longer gear. Maybe that's enlightenment in a piece like that. They can represent different things in the different sculpts, the more organic pieces. They may be representing things that are more spiritual, and I think in the um, more mechanical ones, they maybe represent the, the mechanical side of things. For me, does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah. I just have a small question. Um, the parts that you assemble to make the beautiful art creation, do you? Are, do you bend them? The ones that are round, are they bended or do you, are they all um, um, fully fabricated somewhere else? No, I, I fabricate everything. You fabricate the circles, the, the dog? Yeah, everything. You I, cut it out. I was going to count. <laughs> I was going to count all the pieces in one, and maybe a symmetrical one, so I don't only have to count half of them, right? But, you know, yeah, each. Each individual piece, whether it's a doll that I just cut to a length, or if it's a, if it's a different shape, I will draw it out on a piece of wood and I will cut it out and I will fit, I will round the corner. Let me describe what the, the studio is where, where I build these. There's um, a circular saw, like a chop saw. There's a, a table saw. There's a band saw. Um, a drill press. 
my new best friends are my sanders because yes. they really help me to form the shapes if if i have a circular shape in the piece that um, is an odd size i can't find a dowel of that size then i have to make that shape um, and so when i go by lumber you know primarily everything is kind of about a three quarter of an inch thickness you know for you know like a as you get into the board it's kind of a thing so any of the curves i may take two or three of those layers of you know three quarter inch work half inch work and glue them together mm -hmm. and then i'll rough cut that and then i'll go to the sanders and form it so Anything that has those curves to it is, is that's all. And, and balls, you make two. Yeah. Balls, I, I, found, I found a bin of those in the store. <laughs> <laughs> and this is all to you, you could see it. Two of my very good friends are my nail gun and my <laughs> pin nailer. Uh, nail gun is, you know, just shoots nails. A pin nailer is kind of the same thing, only the nails are much thinner, um, and they show less. I thought, I'll get a pin nailer, and I'll have to do the wood filler, but the craftsman in me, nope, we gotta go back with them. You know, we gotta do that. So no, each, each piece is individually shaped for the mill. Kill dry the wood, you just walk by it and cut it, you have the changes. It does. Um, no, it, the, I'm amazed, quite frankly. No, I'll go and I'll, I'll, I'll do a, occasionally a little dumpster diving to find, you know, if I have a nice piece of you know, wood, a piece of fiber or something like that. But generally, I can go to Lowe's, I can go to Home Depot, and I can find, I mean, everything that I have. The wood that I use is replenishable. I mean, it's pine, it's poplar. It, it's not expensive woods. I'm not a woodworker. Um, I, I know woodworkers. My son is a woodworker, and he is very in tune to different qualities of wood. And, and so that's not as important to me as maybe it should be. Um, it's more important to me that I get the idea down and, um, and kind of build that way. And I've, you know, pieces that are from early days on, four years old, have not shifted. They haven't, you know, nothing's kind of warped or anything. You know, it's, and again, I'm working in the garage. It's not air conditioned. Mm -hmm. I have a fan going every month, so I don't I'll throw the door out. Um, but I'm working out there. And then in order to get to the next piece, I can't, I don't have room in there to leave that piece, so it has to come in the house, which is air conditioned. And so, you know, they, the, the work has gone kind of back and forth. And when it's not in a show or it's not um, <coughs> in studio, it's in storage, which again, there it's under air, you know, kind of a thing. So I haven't had any nightmares yet. Termites terrify me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have a question so much as a comment. Yes. You said to me the other night that you didn't consider yourself a woodworker. No. But I don't really agree with that because wood has a certain quality as a material that's not like anything else. I think I'm and just. If you yeah. were trying to make those pieces out of clay or steel, they'd be completely different. You know, I tell, so yeah, they would. you're working in wood. She's You're a woodworker. True that. I think he's an artist working in wood. That's what yeah. I would say. It. Yeah, I think I know what you're saying. Yeah, and, and there's it's not qualities that, I, that wood have you yeah. don't find in other materials. Wood's very forgiving. It is. Um, well, you know, I talked about growing up. My, my dad built the house. He had welding equipment. I could have learned to weld, but I think he had that when I was interested in other things and I wasn't paying any attention to that. But you know, the fact that I watched him weld, there are times where I think, okay, what's the next phase of things we were talking about? Mm -hmm. Maybe welding and working with metal and some of those shapes um, 
it is certainly a possibility that would be interesting. I enjoy the fact that I'm working with a medium that is almost contrary to the subject matter that I'm working with. And I just enjoy that. that you know, that kind of like, what's that? Now, it doesn't particularly make a world of sense. I, mean, I like that world. <laughs> <laughs> I had a quick practical question. Yeah. When you're working with all the saws and sanders and getting close to the intricate work, what do you do about your beard? <laughs> <laughs> Shampoo it? <laughs> Shake it out? No, you know, there, there are days, I, I noticed this the other day, and it may require a beard trim. I was working on something, I couldn't see it. <laughs> it was down here, and I, I gripped it. So. Or the safety head. I, I don't know. Yeah, it, it is what it is. Roll it up. Yeah, <laughs> shake it out. Stand in it. It's so windy. I love the breeze. I think maybe that's why I'm just standing in the breeze. And... Mary, you had a question. I did. Uh, um... Use the microphone so I can hear you. <laughs> I should bring this home. <laughs> <laughs> Bluetooth speakers all around the hearing aid. Tom, um, come to the kitchen now. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 we talk a lot um, at home about our art, but and I've never asked you this, but I was just thinking about it tonight. Do you, now that you've got your show done and you're going to be moving on to a new body of work, which is exciting, it's an exciting place to be, um, do you have any thoughts about how? You might manipulate the wood if there's carving involved or some other tools that you use to shape the wood. That's, that's a good Remember a few years ago, we um, another good little friend of mine is the Dremel tool. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's got, there are areas, you know, when I'm nailing, um, sometimes the nails go all the way through, you know, to the back of the thing, and I don't want anybody to get hurt, or maybe it just kind of goes underneath the, the piece and sticks out. So I get out my little Dremel tool and you know, I'll grind it out. And you saw it, you know, sparks are flying and this is going on. But I got the Dremel tool years ago because we had seen... I bought it for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we had seen... I think we've gone to the museum and just seen some beautiful wood carving things. Mm -hmm. And um, I had... I had Oh, that's what it was. I had done, as an illustrator, I had done two posters for the Braden from the Woods Fest um, a few years ago. And I developed um, a board, a box, I like boxes, <laughs> the frame around it in it. And when I did the digital print um, for the poster, it was just kind of drawn. But then um, they, they auctioned off the poster and um, I wanted it to be more. So I, I took, um, I wanted to make the frame so I took that Dremel tool and I started to do some you know, simple carving into wood with it. Um, when we were kids, you know, how many did the wood burning thing? You know, it's, um, if you've worked with Dremel, it has all sorts of different bits and you can almost draw with it, you can sand with it, you can do you know, whatever pen you want to put on it. And um, you know, what, you're, what you're suggesting is, you know, everything like I've been saying has been a, kind of an additive process. It'd be kind of interesting to bring some of the um, subtractive qualities to it. Um, in my mind's eye, I think that suggests something maybe a little bit more organic. Um, and that could certainly happen. Um, I don't know. Or contrast to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, one of the pieces that I've got in my mind's eye right now um, has, I, I like to kind of go into the core of things and sometimes. I don't have a piece here um, that really does it as well as maybe some of the others, but maybe it has some interior space where there's nothing. The sculpt is really round and it goes to the wall in between. Or you can just kind of see the, the wall behind the piece because the way it's shaped. Um, some more of that to kind of work with some of those more organic. What I like to do you know, more about that is kind of take 
for mechanical shapes and make them suggestive of something more organic. And I think that's something that I'm going to continue to explore more in this next series of things. Uh, Mary, I don't think we do have wonderful conversations at home. I mean, I, it's, it's very helpful to be married to an artist and uh, to have, and to sit down with your coffee and just kind of talk about the day and what are you going to be doing, what am I going to be doing? Or we talk about you know, specific pieces that she's working on or I'm working on. And uh, the, a piece out in the show um, with the, the white piece um, has a arch on it. And I had done the, the sculpt just as it was. And I looked at it and I wasn't thrilled with it. I, I didn't know what it was. And Mary and I sat down and had a conversation about it. And she just said, there's something about an arch. Didn't, didn't draw it out necessarily, but just kind of said arch. And so I started to think about what that might be like and how you know, that might come to play in the piece and how you know, in my challenge, you know, how do I take that and actually physically make it and make it look like it's kind of floating, um, you know, those kind of collaborative things um, that I'm guessing will continue to kind of inspire and maybe send me in some different directions that I might <laughs> that I might normally do on my own. Um, and, and that's true of, you know, you go to a show, you come here and you see something, you kind of go, hmm, how can I, again, we're artists, we steal, you know, I, I saw the shape, I want to recreate that shape, I want to use that shape. Uh, and, and in a piece that might be something this big that catches your eye, and then becomes something else with in somebody else's hands. Was that even a question? Yes. I don't think it's the only thing, it's more of an influence yes. to take from an artist and you just um, you just expand on it. Kind of like uh, you know, there's blues music and from there you can rock and roll a little bit, but you're stealing the blues music and it's just taking it to a different direction. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But um, I mean, my question is you work so long, <clears throat> excuse me, you work so long two dimensional. And then now you're working the last four years in the three dimensional pieces here. So when you held that up earlier, I saw a two dimensional drawing. Yeah. So I'm kind of getting into your head a little bit here. But when you look at it, do you see it two dimensional or do you see a three dimensional drawing? At that point, I see it as two dimensional. It is. I'm not, what I have to caution myself about is I don't want to. I don't want to think about elevations yeah. here. I just want, I want to see the, the connection. I want to see how this part relates to this part, how this section relates to this section, you know, as a drawing. And then the fun thing is, you know, when I start thinking from 2D to 3D, where I really have to start thinking about the elevation things. How do, how do I interpret, you know, if, you know, these three little shapes here, you know, on this, they're squares. Um, as I'm putting it together and kind of developing the shape, I'm pretty sure they ended up being round um, you know, within that piece and stuff. Um, there's you know, various elevations where you kind of have to you know, look at the construction. Of, and then, you know, I like the channel. You know, how can I make that you know, recede instead of come forward in this area so that the area next to it really locks and comes forward? So, um, no, my, when I'm drawing them, they're purely 2D. And if, again, if, I, if I'm thinking too much about what comes next, I won't have the drawing that I want. I think I'll be thinking too much about the sculpt at that point. You know, I don't want to do that. Let me have the fun when it comes to interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes? How does, oh, sorry. How do you decide whether to keep the wood natural or paint? I mean, does that come at the end? Parts. Yeah. So I've visualized you spending all this time on a great piece. And then like the first time you try to paint it, you're like, oh my God. <laughs> like that that seems like it would have been an evolution in exploring the paint as well. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's a whole other you know, I have I have a son of a dear friend of mine he sent me black white paint. Just to say, hey, if you ever do a piece 
this and you want to see what it looks like under a black light, here you go. Um, I haven't done it because I don't want to do that <laughs> right now, but um, uh, I think, you know, I think some pieces, well, for example, there's one in there called Barometric Twin. Um, it's the natural wood one, it's got, I want, there's a conversation I had with Christina, I almost wanted to paint that pink because it reminded me of Jim Aston in a petrol disco. <laughs> but Mary talked me out of it. Thank you. And um, I think just conversation. I, I was undecided about that one. And, and you know, I, I'm willing to. Um, I like the natural ones. I do. Um, and, and I think some kind of demanded. I, I've got two totem pieces in there. One's a horizontal totem, and one's a, a vertical totem. Kind of multiple parts, one's a diptych, one's a quadriptych or something, of four separate components, and left to natural because it, in my mind, it literally was a tone, and there's something about that leaving it natural um, that just felt right. And then again, the personality of frugal just kind of scream, be industrial yellow and have fun with it, the, the warmth of the red because it's more figurative and reminiscent of you know, blood and, and warmth and, and so on. And the others just kind of unify everything and to get rid of you know, all the individual parts of it and just trying to do something that kind of unifies all circles. I think black does that beautifully. I think the mid-gray does that really well. The white does it well. I think at, you know, anytime you kind of get rid of the wood grain and because you, you don't see the wood filler and things like that, it just takes on a different persona. When you did your first painting, was it, did you learn your piece, or did you look at it? <laughs> like I said, it bubbled up, and that's the way the floppy zombie did. The first one I did, the totem one, I went to Home Depot, bought a spray can of matte black, and just you know, did that. Um, actually, the corner piece originally was done with the same, more than one can, but <laughs> of that. But I, I had it in the show, and the finish on that was very, it, it glowed, and it, it, it was shiny. It was ugly, and I brought it back, and I repainted it um, to kind of lose that sheen and, and just kind of become, again, that whole that was more than the sum of its parts kind of thing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever exhibit the blueprints alongside the construction? What about the blueprints yet? Do you ever exhibit them alongside oh, the final product? I have. We talked about it. We talked about it here. Um, it, it could be, I mean, I could kind of thought a wall of just blueprints kind of overlapping each other, pinned up, and could be kind of cool. Next time. Next time. <laughs> why, why do you ask that question? I mean, well, I'm, it's neat to look at the process, but at the same time, I wonder if seeing the process can sometimes take away from the magic of just seeing the yeah. thing. Part of it. I mean, a lot of the questions tonight have been about process, you know, and kind of, yeah, I mean, that's why I brought it. I'm, I'm a teacher. Um, and so, look at this, look at this. This is going from point A to point B to point C. Um, it makes sense to me, and that's just where my head went. But um, yeah, I think to kind of share the, the process is not a bad idea. First time I've been told I need a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> do it for me. <laughs> no, I'll do it for you. Okay. I understand. I have one as well. Okay. Um, I appreciate how using, and I'm not an artist, so this is from a layman's perspective, and I appreciate how using normal wood allows for congruity in the way the um, piece ends up looking. So. Put together and symmetrical. Did you ever consider working with and mixing woods that have different qualities? Well, some of these are painted because the woods have different qualities. Oh. Poplar is very different than pine. Oh. Pine has a very distinct grain to it usually, and poplar not so much. Oh. 
Um, but, and those are, I think, the two main words that I can afford to, nice. to, to bring into the studio to shape and form it and to do the work. Um, so, and you'll see some variation in the natural wood pieces. There might be, you know, I needed a piece of wood about this size. I went to the scrap box and, oh, this poplar, I'm working in pine. Okay. And then, do I paint it or not? It, you know, I think some of that variation in the wood is what's interesting about the ones that are left natural. Um, yeah. And that wabi sabi thing, you know, they, they're imperfect, they're different, it's not a totally unified look, but a little bit darker grain next to that mid grain, maybe it's kind of worked that way too. Mary, I mean, Mary has... No, I was just saying, using different woods on purpose to create movement or direction in the piece. Yeah. Then I different. become a woodworker. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Um, or it might be using the same wood and starting to think about, uh, you know, what direction do you take it? Maybe I start to think about different Maybe it's leave it in a more natural state, but it's a stain, and then start to assemble that for some of the contrast. Ooh, you got me thinking now. Maybe <laughs> stain. You never know. Well, thank you all so much for coming, and Tom, thank you. Your thank show you. is wonderful, and of course, you gave us a wonderful artist book. Just want to mingle for another few minutes, feel free. And um, thank you for everything. Thank you, Christina and Kinsey and the entire crew because you know it takes a village to raise an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> They've been very, you know, you many of you have relationships with the people here and they've been wonderful. So thank you, Art Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.